So Donnie has been preaching on uh, soil, seed that fell on the hard path and thorny ground and rocky places and then the good soil. And I had this great idea last week that during the welcome, I was going to talk about relationships but during the part because he's talking about soil. And of course, as you know, I mean, when you plant seeds, that's not all that's got to be done. I mean, I watch Doug Alford out there all the time. I mean, it's not just planting the seeds, man. It's putting on the anhydrous. It's putting on the fertilizer. It's cultivating. Is that what we called it? Taking out the weeds? Yeah. All that stuff that's got to be done in order to allow the plant to grow. And then there's all those other things. And so I, I did, to kind of bridge that, I brought up one of our moms. If you looked on Facebook yesterday, you would have saw Sandy's Christmas cactus. And I thought about asking her if I could bring it, but I thought, uh-uh. <laughs> I want to leave it in the window in the library. I'm not going to bring it up here. So, you know, what does a plant need to survive? Well, it needs soil. It needs water. It needs sunshine. Did I say sunlight? Did I say that one already? What else does it need? Air. Air. And so, you know, it's like, it's like in our relationships with our, with our spouse particularly our wives. I want to talk to the guys for a second, particularly those who, are, who have wives. I mean, there's certain things you need. Your, your wife needs security. Like this plant needs soil. Your wife needs security. She needs to know that you're always going to be there. She needs to know that she can trust you. She needs to know that you're going to be there to take care of the family. You're going to take care of, their, take care of her. And like with the soil, if you don't have, if, with this plant, if you don't have good soil, it's not going to grow well, is it? Donnie's talked about that, talked about that for four weeks. The other thing this plant needs, it needs, it needs sunlight. It needs that sunlight coming in. In a relationship, one of the things that you need in your relationship, you need to have special opportunities together. Remember when you first met your spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend? What did you do? You went on dates. You had special occasions together. You went on walks in the park. You went on walks by the lake. You went, uh, did you go duck cutting with him when you first met? I, you know, I don't know. Oh, no, okay. That happened later. We'll talk. <laughs> that was it. All right, none well, there goes that illustration. But, you know, you, you, you have those things where you do special things together. And just like um, it needs air, um, it needs water. In, in, in every relationship, you know, if the plant needs water, I, pl I watered this plant once this week. And you see how it's doing. In relationships, they need, they need communication. They need, you know, a lady needs about an hour of communication a day. Not maybe one a big one one big bunch, but maybe spread it over. They they need to talk. They need to listen. 80, were you disagreeing with me? Eighty percent of the ladies need communication, <laughs> and uh, they need need to have a chance just to talk and, and to debrief. And in that communication, I mean, I don't know what you guys do. I know what my temptation is. Is when my wife it used to be when my wife talked to me, I would look at it through, out of one eye and try to read the newspaper out of the other. Now sometimes I'm playing with my iPad and she's saying something and it's like, yeah, I'm listening. No, it's putting the iPad down, it's putting that down, it's putting the phone down, it's turning away from the TV, it's muting the TV, it's pausing the TV, whatever, and actually giving communication and listening. The other thing a relationship needs, like the plant, um, is it needs physical touch. I use this illustration a lot. It came from Gary Smalley years ago. They say that if a lady or even a guy, receives seven to ten significant touches a day, there'll be less doctor visits. And I told that to a group of soldiers one time, and this one sergeant turned to his wife and went, one, two, three. <laughs> you know, the hugs, the caresses, the caring, the touch makes a difference in relationships. And as Donnie was talking about, uh, plant, talking about the soil, and I got to thinking about plants and how it grows, I got to thinking about that's an illustration of what, of what we need in our relationships together as a husband and wife. You know, the physical touch, the communication, the going on the days together, the security in the relationship, all those things have to be there for that relationship to grow and to thrive and to, and to flourish. And then I take a look at just statistics and other things going on, and I wonder, is it possible to fall in love and stay in love with the same person forever? Sandy and I are working at it. Many of you are working at it. Some of us have charged after it, and it's like, oh and then charge after it again. I'm reminded of that song by the judge. I almost asked Shane if he would sing that this morning, and then I thought, no. I, you know, but in the, in the line, in the, in the judge song, it says, do lovers really stay in love to stay? 
and stand, be, and, stand be, and stand beside each other, come what may? Was a promise really something people kept and not just something they would say? You know? Falling in love, I have found and I have observed, falling in love is pretty much about attraction. Isn't that right? Staying in love, you've got to have the right action. Um... There is something in you and there's something in me that thinks it's possible to stay in love forever. And I think that idea about that idea that where we can stay in love and go forever, I think, I think in essence that's the thumbprints of God. In my life, you know, I'd like to have three or four really close friends who I can talk to. But also in my life, I want that special someone who I can share my soul with, share my life with, share my affection with, that I can bond together in so many different ways that it goes deeper. And I think that desire is in all of us. I think it's in you, and I think it's in me. And it doesn't just go away no matter how many bad relationships we've been in or broken relationships we may have, we may have experienced. It is just in you to want that. And the question comes, is it possible? And I think it is. I mean, even if I stood up here and explained how it wasn't possible, you would disagree and go out and try to do it anyway. Um... But I think falling in love is easy. Staying in love can be difficult. And what I've found is, is you've got to take that noun of love and turn it into a verb. You've got to make love a verb. You've got to make love something you do, not just something you feel. You've heard me speak it many times, and I will as long as I'm here and wherever I go, that Jesus' greatest command, Jesus' command to us, is to love one another. But when Jesus gave that command to love one another, he didn't stop there. He added a hook. He added a barb to it where he says, you love one another just as I have loved you. Making love a verb is not all that new of a concept, but the tendency is to take our cue from our parents. When we think about our personal relationships, particularly with our spouse, if you haven't figured out that's what I'm going to be talking to today, is husbands and wives, is to take that cue and to that we want to take our cue from our parents or from our grandparents, and although those may be great examples, our real cue for loving our spouse, for loving other people, is taken from Jesus Christ. To love one another, for when Jesus says, to, he's saying to us, you love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus says, here's what I say. I'd, here's how I'd like you to love, but, if you, but I'd like you to learn to love the way that I've loved you. I'd like you to take your cue, not from culture, not from your parents, not from others, not from our environment, but I want you to learn to love the way in which that I loved you. So we're going to take an in-depth look of what that means. And it's going to be challenging. And my gut is, in the next few minutes, you sit here and you listen to me. You're going to push back. You're going to get frustrated. You might decide to look up at the ceiling and count the ceiling lights. But when you do that, I want you to stop and think, isn't it true that I'd like to be loved that way? Even though it appears that you're asking me to do the impossible, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be good if you could be loved that way? So imagine if two people came together and decided to love each other the same way that Christ, our Lord and Savior, loved them. If you want to stay in love, that's how it's done. And so if you choose to, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 8 uh, throughout, this, throughout this message. These verses are a very complex message, and a lot of theologians have chosen to write some great doctrine on those because it talks about the Godhead and the Trinity. But I think there's much in those verses where it just kind of talks about the simplicity of loving and caring for others. I, I'm going to give it, I'm going to make it uncomplicated because Paul intent, Paul's intent on what he wrote was obvious. As you know, Paul came along sometime after Jesus had been on the scene, and he looked at the life of Jesus, and he drew some conclusions, and he wrote some letters to some different churches throughout the, throughout the, uh, the Roman world. In this particular church, he wrote to a Greek society in Philippi. And Paul was saying, based on what I've seen, and based on what I've heard, and based on the interviews of people that I've talked to who actually knew Jesus, here is what it looks like 
to love as Jesus loved us. He's saying, here's a picture, here's a model of what it looks like to love in the same way that Jesus loves us. He gives us some instructions to some Christians and to us, and they are general instructions for, our, for all relationships. But what I want to do this morning is to look at these verses through the lenses or filter of that one-on-one -on -one relationship that you either hope to have or that you're in or that you're trying to patch up and repair or the one that you want to soar even higher. So we look at this not, in, not as a general one another, but that one, that one another that you hope to fall in love with. And so in verse 3, Paul writes and says, Do nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So in this verse, he's simply saying, do no thing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The phrase selfish ambition, ambition carries the idea of, competitive, of being competitive. In essence, he's saying, if you want a healthy relationship, if you want to stay in love, don't compete with each other. In other words, when your wife is telling a story and she gets the color wrong, you don't interrupt her and say, no, honey, it wasn't red, it was blue. When she gets the timeline wrong, she, you say, no, it didn't happen in November, it happened in March. When she gets the location wrong, no, it didn't happen in Kentucky, it happened while we lived in Arizona. Just let her tell the story wrong. Don't compete with your spouse. Don't compete with him. Whatever you're feeling, whatever in, own inadequacies you may be feeling, or inferiority or insecurity, whatever the issue is, just remove all of that. Paul is saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or a competitive spirit or a vain conceit. And then he goes on. And the next phrase is the point of my message. The next phrase is actually the title of my message. The next idea is what carries through the passages. And this is the phrase where we respond, I just don't think I can do that. If I do that, I'll be taken advantage of. Okay, I will if she will. But they got to go first because this is too risky. You see, this is, this is the heart of what it means to be in love and to stay in love. Verse, four says, rather, verse, or verse 3 says, Rather in humility, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. What Paul is talking about here, he's talking about an internal decision I'm going to, of how I'm going to live out my life. Value others above yourself. Literally, Act like she is the, most, is the most important to you. Act like he's the most important person to you. Have you ever been, have you ever been around someone who is more important than, have you ever been around someone who's more important than you? You have. Let me tell you where. Have you ever been to a wedding where you were not the bride or groom? Did you notice that people stood in line for hours to talk to them? but they didn't come up to talk to you, say anything to you? Did you notice that when she walked into the room, everybody stood up, but when you walked into the room, nobody noticed that you were around? Because in that context, you were not the most important person in the room. Or maybe you've been around a national hero, and uh, it's hard to believe as you're around this national hero to think about how selfless they were, that they were that you're, that you're there in the same room with them to try to get their book or to hear what they have to say. And in that moment, in that context, you're not the most important person in the room. You would even say, this is a great, this is a great person, and I'm honored just to be in their presence. With all that in mind, how would you treat someone like that? How do you treat someone who's more important than you at that moment, and you're in the same place with them? I'll tell you how you treat them. You defer to them. You defer to them. When they're speaking and you, value them, and you value them highly, you don't interrupt them and tell them, you correct the story to say, no, 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 it's not, it's not silver, it's, it's gold. You don't walk up to them as they're speaking, put your hand in the small of the back and say, posture, posture. No, you defer to them. When they tell a joke that's not so funny, you still laugh. You don't correct them. You defer to them because in that moment, the key is, to, is honor toward them. The key at that moment is to give them honor. It's to give additional respect. I'm going to treat you as if you are more important than me. I'm going to treat you as if you have more value than me. In that moment, you defer to them. You show respect through what you say, through what you don't say, through how you say it. Paul says, 
Paul says that's how you treat other people. And specifically, that's how you treat the person that you're in love with. If you want them to stay in love with you, that's how you treat your husband. That's how you treat your wife. Every single day, every single decision, every day you respond as if you believe that they are more valuable, more important than you are. You might say, well, you know, wait a minute. I, um, they might take advantage of me. Well, they might. Well, I don't know if that's really going to work out in my favor. May not. It's really none of your business if it does. It's about how you are to treat them. Stop and think about what's your, what's your most valued possession? What's the thing that you value the most? You know, a thing that you, you polish and shine, you know, it lives in your garage, or, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, your perspective, your perspective about, that, about that thing is different. You think, you think about how you value and care for your most valued possession. You treat it differently. Whatever your most valued possession is, you treat it consistently. You treat it as special. This is a sense in which how you're to treat them the one whom you love. was that little bit of awe, that, that sense of honor. Paul is saying, and I'm saying, that's how you treat that special someone in your life, with a sense of honor and specialness. And when we don't do that, when people don't do that, that's how they fall out of love. My gut is, I was looking through some wedding pictures on my phone the other day, and some pictures of when Sandy and I were dating, and I remember those days, you know, 41, 42 years ago when we first met. And there was a sense of awe. I mean, there's this, I thought about getting in the JT. There's this great photograph of Sandy and me. We're going to play together a skit at Hamlet Grange College when we were in the <clears throat> Mr. and Miss HLG pageant. Can you believe that? <laughs> but this cool picture, and I, and I look back at that photograph when we're 20, 19 years old, and there's a, oh, you know, don't lose that. Keep that sense of awe going in a relationship of, what, of when you first met. You know, when you first met, you know, you meet that someone and you think, man, I don't want to mess this up. I, I got to treat this special. You know, the girl says, oh, he called me. Oh, that used to be a big deal when we didn't have cell phones, you know. It wasn't as convenient. You give them your undivided attention. So you know, so in doing that, I know you know how to do this, what I'm talking about. Because once upon a time, you certainly did. It comes just a little bit naturally, doesn't it? Look, people who stay in love, they just keep doing that. They learn how to take what first came naturally and then learn to do it intentionally every single day, every single opportunity. They decide you come first. I'm telling you, if, you, if you've ever seen it, if if you've ever seen, seen an experience, you've seen two people come together and these two people decide just to do that. And you know what that is. You know what it is when they, when they put the other person first and when they value the other person above themselves and when they go that distance. You, you know what that's called? It's the S word. It's called submission. It's mutual submission. It's where he goes, you first. And she says, no, no, you go, you go ahead and go first. And the kids are wondering, who's going to get their meal first? I mean, they're just deferring each other. But it's that, that deferring to each other and caring for each other and wanting the other to go first and caring for them. Saying to the other one, no, 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 your, your needs are more important than mine. I want you to do this first. When you see two people come together in that kind of love and respect and value each other like that, it's a powerful, powerful thing. So that's how two people who fell in love stay in love. That's how they generate it. That's how they nurture it. It's done through submission. That's how it gets deeper. That's how it gets better. That's how it gets richer. Like, I, I'm not naive to all of this, and you aren't either. You, you, we all know. We're all old enough here to know there's bumps in the road. You know, there's kids, there's finances, there's circumstances, there's job changes. There are all kinds of things in life. But yet, in every opportunity... The spouse who bows and puts the needs of the other above their own says, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to treat you with greater value than, than I want to be treated myself. It's a decision you make. 
It's a verb you do. It's a lifestyle you develop. When two people do that, it's absolutely unbelievable. You value him. You value her. And you treat them above your, and you, and you value them above yourself. So if that's not enough, Paul continues to write and he says, not looking at your own interest, but each of you looking to the interest of others. Like this is hard for all of us. I've got my interest, you've got your interest. I do what I'm interested in. I mean, what I, what I choose to put money into, what I choose to put emotion into, what I choose to put time into, those are my interests. And they're, they're not always the same interest as those of Sandy. But I find in our relationship it pays to choose to put interest into her things and the things that, that she cares about. Paul says you learn to express and show interest in the things of the one that you want to stay in love with. You talk to them about their interest. You, you ask them about their interest. You engage with them about their interests. And you go from there. You know, that's what you do when you want to stay in love. You don't just simply put up with their interest. You find a way to become interested and show interest in their interests. You want to stay in love. You learn to get out of your comfort zone a little and you learn to express interest in the interest of the person that you're in love with. And you know how to do this too. I mean, <laughs> how I know is because when you first met and fell in love, you found out what they were interested in. And somehow or temporarily, you were into it. Oh, I love to fish. You've never been fishing a day in your life. Dad, Dad, can I borrow a fishing pole? Oh, I love to run. You don't even walk anywhere, let alone run. And you go to your friend, he has to borrow a pair of used running shoes so it doesn't look so obvious. You know, those things, you learn to take an interest in other people. We know how, we know how to show interest, but once we're in, we forget, we forget that we have to stay there. You want to stay there? You want there to be a deep int intimacy? You live as if, they are more important than you, which means their interests become at least as important as your own interests. Look, I realize probably to some extent this sounds ideal. It sounds idealistic. It sounds like it comes from a different generation, some other world. You're picking this stuff up from Gary Smalley from 40 years ago about a plant. Come on, dude. It's 2022. It's not 1991 anymore. I think maybe when Paul was writing this letter to the people in Philippi, I think maybe he began to scratch his head too and thinking, you know, I'm writing some pretty heavy stuff. They're going to think, this is not possible to do. Put the interests of others above your own, you know, in all humility, valuing, valuing somebody above yourself. I bet they're reading this and thinking, nobody does that. This is so extreme. Who's going to do that? And so Paul takes us to the part where Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And Paul is saying, let me kind of illustrate the way that Jesus loved you. Jesus, in these next few verses, Jesus shows us a model. Paul writes and shows us the model. And the model that is presented to us is not the way your mama loved you. It's not the way your, your dad loved your mom or your grandpa and your grandpa loved each other. Here is what love looks like. In verse 5, it says, in relationship with one another, that special relationship, have the same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had. I want you to approach your relationship with, with the one that you're in love with, with the same attitude that Christ had toward you. The same perspective. It's, it's like a command. He says, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Did you ever stop and think about that? Who, being Jesus, was in the very nature of God, and he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. That's huge. You know, in our marital relationships, I think, okay, I make up 50%, you make up 50%, you know, where's my piece of the pie? I should, I should be at least 50% of this, uh, I, should, I should receive at least 50% of the attention 
I'm at least as good as him. I'm at least as good as her, at least as important as, as him or her. I, I have certain rights, and I, I, can either, I should be able to ask for those rights in, the, in this relationship. But Paul says, okay, let me tell you what the model is. Here is Jesus, who is in the very nature of God, and yet not one time in his earthly ministry did he push the I'm God button. Not one time did he come to a place and go to a row and say, hey, hey, uh, this, is, this is for me and my posse move over, move over, I'm Jesus. Not once did he go into a, to a restaurant or someplace to eat and say, hey, that's our table, I'm Jesus. Never in his whole ministry did he leverage who he was for his own sake. So I'm tempted to do it all the time. I mean, you're tempted to do it all the time. Don't they know who you are? Doesn't he realize what you've done? You birthed those children. You raised those children. Doesn't she know who you are? You brought in all the income to, to provide all of this. We all leverage points for where we are and what we've done. But Paul says, okay, if you want to follow Jesus, here's what Jesus did. He was more important than anybody. He was more important than anybody else in the room. Every time he showed up, he was the bride. Every time he showed up, he was the hero. Every time he showed up, he was the celebrity. He was the rock star. He was the writer. He was the business genius. Every time he showed up in the room, he was the most important person in the room. He never leveraged that for his own sake. And that's the model. In verse 7, it says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of the servant. In other translations, it literally says, He emptied himself everything he had coming to him, all of his rights, all the respect owed to him, all the attention due him, he emptied himself of that. When Jesus came, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. You know what we say about people in our culture? She's so full of herself. He's so full of himself. 2,000 years ago, Paul writes and says he empties himself. And that's the model. Jesus came and he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness. He didn't have to do that. So why did he do it? What was he up to? What was the point of it? Nobody made him do it. And being found in the appearance as a human being, he humbled himself. Being made in human likeness. He humbled himself. He made the decision. This is a verb. No one humbled Jesus. No one humbled him. He humbled himself. He decided to place himself under. He decided to submit. He decided to be subordinate to subordinate his will. He decided to humble himself. And guess who he humbled himself to? He humbled himself to you. And he humbled himself to me. He humbled himself by, by doing what? By calling and saying he's going to be late for dinner? No, it's bigger than that. He, did he humble himself by doing a better job in the budget so as to, to, lack at, to make less conflict? It was bigger than that. Did he humble himself by giving seven to ten touches every day, a significant touch? No, it was even bigger than that. What did he do to demonstrate making this new relationship with mankind? The scripture says, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's a sense in which I think Jesus had a dilemma, if I can dare say that Jesus had a dilemma or that God had a dilemma. It's like he couldn't have it both ways. The dilemma was this. He would say, I can either maintain my rights, I can maintain the respect that I'm due, 
I can maintain getting my way because I'm always right. I'm never wrong. No one ever has to correct my story. I get the colors right. I get the sequence right. I never, I always get it right. I can maintain everything I deserve but have no relationship with humanity. Or I can dip into their world in order to establish a relationship with mankind. But to do so, I have to give up what's due me, my rights, my respect, and the glory that should come as the Son of God. But I can't do it both ways. I can't get everything I'm due but have nothing to do with them so I can become one of them and submit myself to the creature, the creator submitting to the created in order to pay for their sin and pave the way for them to have a relationship with me. But to do so, I have to give up everything that I'm due. But I can't have it both ways. When Jesus died on the cross for your sin, he put your deal ahead of his deal. He put your forgiveness ahead of his glory. He put your greatest need ahead of what he rightfully deserved. When Jesus died on the cross, he put you first. He put me first. He submitted himself to us, and not only did he not need to do it, we were not even equals to begin with. His dilemma was, if I want relationship, I have to die to who I am. To maintain who I am and everything do me, then there will be no relationship to mankind. And your Heavenly Father, through His Son Jesus Christ, opted for relationship over respect. He opted for relationship over demanding His way. He opted for relationship over all the glory He should have received. He couldn't have it both ways. And friends, you can't have it both ways either. When it comes to that special relationship, that thing that goes beyond a group of friends, the intimacy that goes beyond the physical, the thing that God has given you the wonderful desire for, if it's going to be everything you want it to be, God has made it clear, part of you has to die. Part of you will have to submit. There will be some things that you have to surrender because you can't have it both ways. Look, you've watched people try. You've, fought, you've watched people try to have it both ways. And perhaps you've tried to have it both ways. And what you ended up with was just a roommate. What you ended up with was just living with someone in contract. What you ended up with was a relationship where you got your way every single time, but you're not happy and you're not satisfied. It's only when two people come together and you say, I'm going to surrender my rights to you as you surrender your rights to me. in that epicenter, and that's the most amazing thing imaginable. And God created the potential for that. And he didn't just create the potential for that. He sent his son to this world to model that. The reason you come to God through Jesus Christ your Savior is not simply because he's the son of God. It's that he would submit himself on God's behalf in what he did for you. You call him God, your heavenly, what he did for you, so that you can call him, call him God, your heavenly father. He opted for relationship over his personal rights. And that's the call of love. That's the call and requirement for being and staying in love. Sounds like a pretty high price to pay, doesn't it? Don't kid yourself and pretend or believe that you can do it any other way. I'm telling you, there are people around you, and it's the most awesome thing to see, the most awesome thing to, to experience. It's the most fulfilling thing, and God created you to experience that. The key is right here, and that's what your Heavenly Father desires for you, but you can't have it both ways. Look, you can spend the rest of your life being right. You can spend the rest of your life making a point, and that is the point. You can spend the rest of your life winning all the arguments. 
You can spend the rest of your life getting her in shape or getting him in shape, but you will not be in love at the end of the process. You'll be able to support your angle. You'll be able to support your approach. You can sit down with a counselor and you can absolutely be right every single time. But you will have lost the thing that you cherish and want the most. Jesus did not come, in the, come into the world to, came, to be right. He came into the world to submit himself for your sake and my sake and on behalf of the world. And in submitting himself and in surrendering himself and in dying for our sin, he discounted the opportunity to be right every single time. He could have nagged every, every single one of us. He could have come into this room and said, sinner, 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 don't raise your hand, I'll tell you what you did. You know, you didn't do it right, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. He didn't do that. He would have been right 100% of the time. And we wouldn't have had a Savior. Because you can't have it both ways. So are you saying that we should never argue? Saying we never, should never discuss things? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying at some point in your relationship, you have to decide. Am I going to err on the side of submitting and surrendering myself? Or am I going to decide, no, this is my way, my rights, and this is how it's done. And I can, argue, and I can, argue, and I can out-argue everybody. But you can't have it both ways and stay in love. There's a way to resolve every conflict and a way of honoring both parties. Once you decide up front that I'm going to treat you as the most, as the most valuable person in the world and the most important person in the room in my life. Can you imagine? Like, you know what I know. Wouldn't you love to be loved that way? Where someone treated you as the most important person in the room? Where they put your needs and your interests above their own? Where they would pause and just listen? Where they would put their stuff aside and pay attention to what's going on with you? Wouldn't you love to be treated that way? I think that's what Paul was talking about. I think he was talking about us, about us honoring and caring for each other in that way. Like I know emotions play a huge part and there's complexities with all that and that's not the purpose of the sermon to talk about those. But let me ask again, what would it look like today? What would, what would it, just ask yourself this, what would it look like today in your key relationship or any relationship if you decided, you know what? I can't have it both ways. I'm going to opt for relationship over getting in my way. I'm going to opt for relationship over my rights. I'm going to opt for relationship over demanding respect. What would this look like? What would it look like to consider the interest of the other person over your own interests? What would it look like? What would it look like? Then do that. Do that. Because love is a verb. It's something you do. That is what people who stay in love do over the course of their life together. Look, I, I know it's hard. I've done a lot of marriage counseling over my, over my ministry career. I'll tell you what, it's more better to be involved in marriage counseling than to go through a divorce. It's a whole lot cheaper to go through marriage counseling than to go through a divorce. You know, I get 20, 25, 50, 100 bucks maybe to do a marriage. I've thought about saying, you know what, I don't want anything for doing the marriage, but if you divorce, I want a piece of the settlement. Because it seems like the lawyer on the back end gets a whole lot more money for breaking up the marriage than the preacher got for putting it together. You know, it's hard. Of course it's hard. Is it worth it? Yeah. Just find somebody who's in that kind of relationship. And they'll tell you it's hard, but it's also worth it. The bottom line, it's a decision you make. And you have to make it whether your partner makes it or not. But if you do, not only will you have fallen in love, you will have taken the most important step to ensure that you stay in love. 
the most, the most amazing thing of all, it's God's plan for you. And so this week, in a deeper way than ever before, I encourage you, make love a verb. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, for the couple here just hanging on by a thread, thinking, I don't know if that's for us. I don't even know if he is paying any attention. I don't know where he is. Would you just please give them the wisdom to know what to do with what they just heard? For the person here that has a real hard time with church and God and Jesus and prayer, here they are. They were invited. They came. Would you give them the wisdom to know what to do with what they've heard? And for the couple ready to make their relationship or to take their relationship to the next level, would you give them the wisdom to know what to do with what they just heard? Father, would you love love us and surround us with your compassion? We'd love to be the generation who knows how to love unconditionally as this church to reflect your amazing love to everyone. So just give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard and give us the courage to act upon that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.